This July, Womanica has teamed up with Nike to tell the stories of elite athletes from history to today. We're celebrating the women who performed physical and mental feats in sports. We're talking about athletes. For stories of women who overcame societal barriers, personal struggles, and fierce competition to pursue their dreams of glory, listen to Womanica all month long, wherever you get your podcasts. Hello. From Wonder Media Network, I'm Jenny Kaplan, and this is Womanica. This month, we're celebrating women who performed physical and mental feats in sports. They overcame societal barriers, personal struggles, and fierce competition to pursue dreams of glory. We're talking about athletes. Today, a trailblazing Black athlete who was also a star student. She changed figure skating and sports for the better. Life as such a high achiever was a challenge to maintain, but she recently took to the ice again at the age of 56. Meet Debbie Thomas. Debbie Thomas was born in Poughkeepsie, New York, on March 25, 1967. When she was two years old, her parents moved the family to San Jose, California. They divorced shortly thereafter, and Debbie lived with her mom. Janice was a computer programmer, one of the few Black women in a largely white, male-dominated field. Debbie first started ice skating when she was five years old. A few years later, her mom hired a coach, and Debbie started competing. Everyone could see Debbie wasn't just good. She was really good, a real prodigy. Debbie kept training and winning competition after competition. And while Janice had a good job, it wasn't enough to cover the exorbitant cost of competition fees, travel, coaching, and costumes, sometimes totaling as much as $25,000 a year. So at times, Debbie would have to take breaks from training and competing while her mom caught up on the bills. Figure skating has always been a sport filled with people who are largely affluent and white, and judging at the time was notoriously subjective. Debbie's family noticed how judges would comment on her looks, telling her to play down certain aspects and other couched racist comments. She even received baffling reductions at times, seemingly based more on appearance rather than performance. Still, Debbie had always been deeply ambitious and determined. She knew what she wanted from a young age to be a figure skater and a doctor. She applied to colleges, and on her applications, Debbie described herself in one word, invincible. She received offers from Harvard, Princeton, and Stanford. She chose to stay in California, and in 1985, she enrolled at Stanford. Debbie took on a rigorous pre-med workload while continuing with her grueling skate schedule. It was a decision many in the skating world were quick to question. But Debbie ignored them and did it anyway. While in her sophomore year, Debbie really hit her stride with skating. She landed five consecutive triple jumps on her way to claim the U.S. Figure Skating Championship. She was the first Black woman to win the title at the senior level. Then she went on to Worlds, where she took the gold again. In 1987, Debbie started preparing for the Olympics. She took a leave from Stanford and moved to Denver to train. A year later, she arrived in the Olympic Village in Calgary for the main event. More than 60 million people tuned in to watch. It was a huge moment for the sport. European skaters had dominated for years. If she triumphed, Debbie Thomas would be the first American woman to win gold in more than a decade. With the eyes of the nation and the world upon her, she prepared to take the ice. Debbie did well in the first two events, compulsory figures and the short program. She was in the lead going into the final event, the free skate. That meant she would be skating last. I see. Well, my monitor is not quite clear on that. Her big rival was East Germany's Katarina Witt. Katarina had won gold in the last Olympics, and she and Debbie had consistently been in the top two spots for the past couple of world championships. This was Debbie's first Olympics, but the two were a powerful matchup. Katarina later said, she was the only one who could really beat me. Both women had unknowingly to the other selected music from the iconic opera, Carmen. It became known as the Battle of the Carmens. It's time to compare Carmens. Katarina's performance was awarded high marks for artistry, but her technical score was underwhelming. 
So the door was open for Debbie as she prepared to skate her own Carmen program. She takes to the ice. She's wearing a black dress with red and white embellishments, a subtle nod to the colors of the opera. As the music begins, Debbie picks up speed, arms outstretched. She winds up, preparing to jump. She leaps and rotates in the air once, twice, a third time, and she lands on her right leg, the left stretched out behind her gracefully. There's no time for celebration. Immediately, her outstretched leg becomes the catalyst for the next jump in the combination. Debbie launches into the air. She rotates again. One, two, three. But this time, she stumbles. Debbie lands on both feet. There was still time to recover. She was just beginning her four-minute program. But Debbie never regained her balance. Off-character fumbles and stumbles continued. Well, there it is for Debbie... Debbie Thomas, not her best moment. As she got off the ice, Debbie was deflated. She said she felt like she'd let America down. Debbie still claimed the bronze medal. And in so doing, she became the first black athlete to win a medal at the Winter Olympics. But for her, it didn't feel like a victory. She was in a daze at the award ceremony and failed to shake Katerina Witt's hand at the podium. Many perceived that to be poor sportsmanship. Debbie skated in another world championship, where she also won the bronze medal. She then decided to retire from amateur skating. She returned to Stanford, earning her bachelor's degree in 1991. She got a medical degree from Northwestern University in 1997 and started working as an orthopedic surgeon. She married and had a son. But Debbie struggled to find her footing in the medical world. She bounced around, moving to Indiana and then Virginia, where she started her own private practice. As a specialist in a poor area, she struggled to make ends meet. In 2014, Debbie declared bankruptcy. She got divorced and lost custody of her son. And she continued to clash with other medical professionals. She was detained in a hospital and diagnosed with bipolar disorder, a diagnosis she later challenged in a medical board hearing saying it had been reached too quickly. She has not since commented on it. Debbie let her medical license expire. She moved into a trailer with her boyfriend. And this challenging time in her life became the subject of headlines and reality TV networks, declaring, the best African-American figure skater in history is now bankrupt and living in a trailer. In 2023, Debbie made news again, this time for her return to the ice. What happened in the interim isn't clear. Debbie lives in Florida now, and at 56 years old, she started competing again, placing second at the World Figure and Fancy Skating Championships. She called it one of the hardest things she's done. Mostly, she shared her joy at returning to the sport she loves, on her terms. All month, we're talking about athletes. For more information, find us on Facebook and Instagram at Womanica Podcast. Special thanks to Liz Kaplan, my favorite sister and co-creator. Talk to you tomorrow. This July, Womanica has teamed up with Nike to tell the stories of elite athletes from history to today. We're celebrating the women who performed physical and mental feats in sports. We're talking about athletes. For stories of women who overcame societal barriers, personal struggles, and fierce competition to pursue their dreams of glory, listen to Womanica all month long, wherever you get your podcasts. In 2020, in a small California mountain town, five women disappeared. I found out what happened to all of them, except one, a woman known as Dia, whose estate is worth millions of dollars. I'm Lucy Sheriff. Over the past four years, I've spoken with Dia's family and friends, and I've discovered that everyone has a different version of events. Hear the story on Where's Dia? Listen on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts. In 2009, Maitrice Richardson was released from the Malibu Lost Hill Sheriff Station, and she never made it home. 
Nearly a year later, Mitrice's remains were found in a canyon, six miles from the station. Her death is Malibu's greatest unsolved mystery. I'm Dana Goodyear in Lost Hills, Dark Canyon. What happened to Mitrice Richardson? Listen on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts. My kids like this podcast so much. It helps them focus at school, and they learn so much from it. I am a kid, and me and my little brother listen to it every night before bed. I love Lingo Kids! Yes, I'm eight years old, and I don't care. I still love it. (laughs) Parents, our podcast is here to capture imaginations, spark curiosity, inspire new ideas, and even help with bedtime routines. Enjoy it with your kid. Listen to Lingo Kids Stories for Kids on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts.